let's go ahead. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, will the secretary do roll call? Um, actually, if you, let's see, I think the first item on the agenda is, if you just follow the agenda, it is okay. um, just to ask for a motion to approve the minutes, and then um, if you wanted to, if anyone wants to review a couple minutes, or it's up to you. Let's recognize everybody that's here. Sure. First to know? Yep. Wild? Yep. Schoenberg? Yes. Hanze? Yes. And uh, missing today is Clay Dietrich and Dave Obermiller. So first on the agenda would be to uh, make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from the meeting of October 4th, 2018. I'll make a motion to approve. Can we get a second? Uh, the minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Motion carries. Uh, do we have any unfinished business we have to attend to? We do, but um, we're tracking all the notes, making comments um, that have been made by the board and we'll probably address those in our December meetings do them all at one time okay sounds good do I have to motion for to approve any unfinished business business on that sure okay is there a motion we get a motion to approved to approve the unfinished business no 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 need to no nope. need, no need to okay all right. okay and then uh, we have some new business. We have a recognition of a past member, Wayne Larson. Board, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a past board member for his service to the board. Um, like anybody, I Googled Wayne Larson. <laughs> And I found about 50,000 Wayne Larsons. I googled Wayne Larson Fargo and found about 40. So it was hard to find information about Wayne. But he's on Facebook. <laughs> <coughs> I know when he was born. I know he's married. He's a male. He has at least one daughter who graduated from a school with a black gown and a yellow tassel. We have two mutual friends. <laughs> Hometown of Ryder. Uh, he's active in sports. He's a bison aficionado. He goes to football games, maybe basketball. And he's all over in minutes in the state, maybe in various states, uh, Hector Airport projects, Becker County projects. He's a member of the Optimist, or has been, and North Dakota Society of Professional Engineers, and was voted Young Engineer of the Year. I won't say what year, that'll give away everything else. <laughs> yes. um, and he was on the board of the, that group. Wayne Larson <clears throat> started with the board in June of 2007, uh, reappointed in 2012 and expired on 2017. So he had uh, 10 great years here. He retired from Soli and Larson Engineers. I called and they said, Wayne who? <laughs> and then gave me lots of good information on him because I couldn't find it in Google. Uh, he was a structure and he reviewed our structural portions of our code changes and gave the board <coughs> great information and explanations on structural code issues. He provided the board and staff with strong leadership skills, and we really enjoyed his time on the board. I want to say that this board, it's a great thing. Um, we kind of explain our process to other people in our industry, and they really can't believe that we do what we do. 
the International Code Council has a grand code hearing schedule and they do it for the whole world. Minnesota does one on its own scale. Fargo does one on its scale. And there's not many cities that do what we do. Get code input from as many people as we can and from a board. It's a board of citizens. And that's what makes it great. It's, uh, we always say our code does come from the board and not from us. You hear, every, hear the changes, know what they are, and make the decisions for our code for our city. So we appreciate that. Thank Wayne for your service. And I have the plaque. It says, presented to Wayne Larson in recognition and appreciation of your dedicated service as a member of the Board of Appeal. Thanks a lot. Speech. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody said I had to give a speech. Uh, no, I enjoyed the time I spent on the board, and uh, it's a good deal and, and fun to take part in. And, I thank you very much for the recognition. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Uh, let's see, as far as uh, continued new business, we've got to uh, move on to review of International Residential Code, chapters one through six. I'm Melissa Galrep. I work with the Fargo Inspections Department. I'm going to start the review on the uh, International Residential Code. We're going to go through um, Chapter 1 through 6 today. Uh, there's going to be a number of places in the code where they've changed minor things like wording or um, changed things for clarity. They didn't change the intent of the code or the effect. And so we're not going to go through every single little mark in the code book that says that there was a change because we'd be here all day. So instead, we'll, we'll hit the highlights. And uh, if you have any questions, obviously, um, stop us. Otherwise, we're going to run straight through uh, the first six chapters today. And so uh, chapter one is uh, a lot of housekeeping. So there are a number of amendments that are kind of standard. The first amendment is uh, section R101.1 on page one which is uh, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment inserting the word city of Fargo as the name of the jurisdiction. Section R101.2, still on page one, um, is a new section that specifically allows care facilities for five or fewer persons to be constructed under the IRC. Um, this has been in the IBC since 2012 so it isn't a change to the actual effect, it's just made explicit in the IRC as well now. Section R104.8 on page two, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment that adds a paragraph on liability. Section R104.8.1, still on page two, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, adding the words or omission, or omission and specifying the immunities or defenses provided. Section R104.10.1 on page three, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment deleting this section in its entirety as it conflicts with locally adopted flood proofing codes. Section R104.11, also on page three, this section has been reworded for clarity and to specify that the alternate methods allowed must be equivalent in quality, strength, effectiveness, fire resistance, durability, and safety. So they just made it a little more explicit. Section R105.2, uh, staff recommends continuing the existing local amend amendment detailing which work is exempt from permit. It's the same list we've had for several code cycles in a row, so no changes there. Section R105.3.1.1 on page five, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, deleting this section regarding floodplain enforcement. 
Section R105.5 on page 5. This section now specifies that a permit expires if there's more than 180 days between inspections rather than if the work is abandoned for more than 180 days. Uh, this change gives us a way to verify the time span instead of uh, having the homeowner call and say, oh, I, I drove a nail yesterday, so it's not abandoned, and it sort of extends out forever. Uh, this gives us a way to say it's been 180 days since you had us in to take a look at the work, um, and so we can consider their project abandoned at that time, but the building official still has the authority to grant extensions to the permits. Section R106.1.4 on page 6. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, deleting this section regarding floodplain enforcement. There's a number of places throughout the code where they do floodplain uh, enforcement and code that we have supplanted with local codes. So the, all of those will have, have been taken out and will they'll come up over and over again <laughs> over the course of the review. Uh, section R106.4 on page 6, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment deleting this section requiring that a set of approved construction documents be su uh, supplied. Section R108.3 on page 7, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment adding information about determining the valuation for a building permit. And then section R110.1 has been reworded for clarity, but there's no change to the intent or the effect. That's it for chapter 1. Anyone? No. All right, so chapter 2 is a definitions chapter. Um, Section R201.3 on page 11, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, altering the references throughout the entire code book um, to refer to the locally and state adopted fire, um, uh, plumbing, electrical, and flood codes because they're not the same, they're not the ICC codes. Section R202 is definitions, and it's the rest of the chapter is one section, so it's just a whole list of additions. Uh, throughout the rest of the chapter, there have been um, changes to rewording and updating reference standards, and so you'll see lots and lots of little marks, but essentially they went through the whole chapter and updated the standards that they refer to, so there isn't a change to the actual definition of the words. Um, and then to avoid confusion, they've taken the word accessible and the phrase readily accessible out throughout the code, and they've changed it. Instead of accessible, it now says access to, and instead of readily accessible, it says ready access to. They decided that accessible was confusing because people thought of that in terms of ADA code and not in terms of building code. And so they've changed a number of places where they took out the word accessible and they put in specific clearance and access requirements. Uh, on page 13, uh, definitions for carbon monoxide alarm and carbon, carbon monoxide detector have been added to clarify the difference between the two. And on page 19, a definition for historic building has been added because uh, in chapter 11, the energy code section, there is a specific set of sections that deal with historic buildings. That's it for chapter two. Any questions or? All right, chapter three, uh, table 301.2 parentheses one on page 32. This table that we, we fill in every time we adopt a new code, uh, they expanded it a great deal to include uh, mechanical design requirements, most of which are based on uh, Manual J, which is used to design residential um, mechanical systems. Uh, so we fill in the new expanded table. A lot of these values came from Manual J or from some extrapolation from default standards that are used for design. So um, you should have a copy of the filled out table with your packet, like on the back of the page. <laughs> so um, I can read through quickly what the numbers are so that uh, anyone who doesn't have a copy can fill it in. The ground snow load is 50 pounds. The wind design speed is 115 miles per hour. Topographic effects is no. Special wind region is no. Windborne debris zone is no. Seismic design category is zone A. 
Um, weathering is severe. The frost line depth is four and a half feet and termite damage is none. The winter design temp is negative 18 degrees. Ice barrier underlayment required is yes. Flood hazards, which is when we first adopted our flood codes, is 1978. The air freezing index is 4,000. The mean annual temp is 41.5 degrees. Our elevation is 869. Our latitude is 46. Our winter heating is negative 17 degrees. And our summer cooling is 88 degrees. Our altitude correction factor is none. The indoor design temperature is 70 degrees and the design temperature cooling is 75 degrees. The heating temperature difference is 87 degrees. The cooling temperature difference is 13 degrees. The wind velocity for heating is 15 miles per hour and the wind velocity for cooling is seven and a half miles per hour. The coincident wet bulb is 70 degrees. The daily range is M for medium. Uh, the winter humidity is 30% and the summer humidity is 50%. Wow, that's a lot of information. Yes. <laughs> this table has really been expanded since. A great deal, yes. 2000. There used to be eight, yeah. nine, ten numbers on the table. And yeah. Um, section 301.2.4 on page 56. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment deleting this section as it pertains to flood. Section 302, um, throughout the fire resistant construction section, there have been uh, references added to section 703.3 <coughs> of the International Building Code as an alternate for compliance. Again, this is something that you could always have done, but it was never made explicit in the IRC. Table 302.1, parentheses one, on page 58. Staff recommends changing the existing local amendment, uh, continuing to reduce the required fire resistance separation for walls and projections, the first two rows, from five feet to three feet. Uh, the rest of the table actually has been changed to agree with our old amendment, so the balance of the amendment that we used to make is no longer necessary. And then the footnotes were reworded for clarity, but the effect is still essentially the same. Section 302.2 .2 on page 58. This section has been rewritten to allow for two one hour fire resistant rated walls called a double wall in the code um, that does the exact same thing that our previous amendment to this section did and so we no longer need that amendment. Section 302.4.2 .2, item four, listed luminaries have been added listed luminaires have been added to the list of allowable membrane penetrations. Section 302.5.1, staff recommends extending the local amendment deleting the requirement for a self-closing device to include the new requirement for an automatic closing device, um, essentially just striking the last part of that uh, last paragraph of the section. Section 302.10.1, uh, that was reworded just for clarity. It's a kind of a big chunk, but it's just uh, some rearrangement and there's no change to the uh, requirement. Section 302.13, item two, electric powered heating appliances now trigger the requirement for floor protection in crawl spaces in addition to storage and fuel fired appliances. <coughs> Section R303.4 on page 63 still. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, deleting this section in its entirety in order to coordinate with the International Building Code where this requirement is also deleted. Section 307.1 on page 65, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, changing the reference in this section to the North Dakota State Plumbing Code and requiring clearance in front of water closets and bidets to be a minimum of 24 inches in order to coordinate with the North Dakota Plumbing Code. Section 308.4.2, item two. The words perpendicular to have been replaced with less than 180 degrees from when considering whether glazing adjacent to a door must be safety glazing. 
Uh, this clarifies how angle walls should be treated when they're next to a door. It used to just be only perpendicular. And so they said, well, what about the walls in between? So they just added that. Section R308.4.4.1, page 67. This new section cre creates a requirement for a top rail on glass guardrails. Uh, the new language requires that the top rail remain in place if the, um, if the glass baluster fail, so that there's still something to keep you from going over. Section R309.3 on page 69, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment deleting this sec entire section as it addresses flood areas. Section 310.2.2, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment uh, regarding window sill height for egress windows. And section 310.2.3.1, Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment allowing platforms and terraced window wells uh, to the code's methods for compliance. Section R310.3 on page 70 still, the requirement for bulkhead enclosures for below grade doors has been changed to the same area well requirements as for egress windows. Staff recommends adding a local amendment allowing the platforms and terraced window wells the same as we did for uh, the egress windows in section 310.2.3. Section 311.3 on page 71, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment adding a second exception for eliminating landings at exterior doors other than the re required egress door. Section R11.3.1, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment altering the section for required egress doors to allow for an eight inch maximum difference to coordinate with the riser height amendment in uh, section 311.7.5.1. So there's a number of places throughout the, the next several sections where um, we have the seven and a half inch maximum or seven and three quarters that we changed to eight. And so we have to just sort of carry that all the way through. Section 311.3.2, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment altering the section for other exterior doors to allow the maximum eight inch difference. Section R311.7.5.1 on 72, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment allowing a maximum riser height of eight inches. Section R311.7.5.2, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment requiring a tread depth of not less than nine inches. Section 311.7.5.2.1, Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment requiring a minimum tread depth of not less than nine inches for winder, uh, for winder treads. And then section 311.7.6, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment adding a second exception for landings at exterior doors. To, uh, this coordinates with the amendment to 311.3 um, where we eliminated the requirement for other exterior doors. Sections R311.7.8.2 through uh, 311.7.8.4 on page 73. These sections have been reorganized for clarity. Um, there is a little change though. Handrail clearance now has an exception that allows an extra two inches of projection at landings, floors, or passing flights of stairs, just to make it a little easier to make those um, easings and those returns uh, to accomplish and still meet the intent of the code. Section R311.7.11 and R311.7.12, um, alternating tread devices and ship ladders are now allowed to be used as a part of the means of egress for lofts and mezzanines 200 square feet or less, uh, provided that the device is not the sole access to a kitchen or a bathroom. R312.1.1, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, uh, removing the requirement for the height of a floor or grade to be measured 36 inches from a walking surface when determining whether a guard is required. Section R313.1 on page 75, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment requiring townhouses located more than, 15, more than 150 feet down a private street or access road uh, have fire sprinklers installed 
This is uh, coordinated with the fire code. Section R313.1, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, removing the reference to Chapter 29 and adding design standards as alternatives. Section R313.2, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, deleting this section and its subsections entirely in accordance with the state code. This is the requirement for sprinklers. Section R314.2.2, the words or where one or more sleeping rooms are added or created in existing dwellings were removed as they were considered redundant. The same change was made to section R315.2.2 for carbon monoxide detectors. So it was just a reword. It didn't change the intent or the effect. Section R314.3, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, adding item five, requiring an additional smoke detector in locations where the ceiling height of a room open to the hallway serving the bedrooms is 24 inches or more higher. Section R314.4 on page 75, uh, the exception for the interconnection of smoke alarms uh, under renovations has been removed. Code now requires physical or wireless interconnection of all cases where interior work requiring a building permit is performed. So now um, they, they've made it retroactive in the 15 that you have to do the smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors for the whole house. Um, now they've taken out the exception to the interconnection of smoke detectors. So now when you do an interior remodel, you have to do the smoke detectors for the whole house and they all have to be interconnected, whether it's uh, wireless or wired. Section R315.5, uh, this is a new section that requires carbon monoxide alarms to be interconnected but does include the exception for remodels. Section R317.3.1 on page 80. Stainless steel staples have been added as, an accept as acceptable fasteners for treated wood. Section R35, R322 on page 81. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, deleting this section in, in its entirety as it conflicts with local code ordinance, flood ordinances. Section R324 on page 85, uh, information on photovoltaic systems was previously spread out between chapters three and chapter nine. The roof load and the penetration requirements were moved from chapter nine into chapter three so that they were all in the same place. Sections 324.6 and 324.7 on page 86, these sections regarding the photovoltaic systems on, on roofs have been reworded and expanded to coordinate with the International Fire Code requirements. Section 325.6 on page 87, this new section removes the technical information for habitable attics from the definition in chapter two to the relevant design section. Uh, item number four was added to limit the size of habitable attics to, the, to those, that of the exterior walls below. So you can't have a cantilevered habitable attic Section R26, or R326 on page 87, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, deleting this section in its entirety. And section three, R327, this new section uh, details the relevant standards and the installation requirements for storage batteries, uh, includes exceptions for electric vehicles and small batteries common in things like tools and alarm systems. So it's just really looking at um, coordinate with, coordinating with the photovoltaic system for large storage batteries. That's it for chapter three. Any questions? Nope. Chapter four, section 401.1 on page 89. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, changing the references for a flood hazard design to refer to the city of Fargo's adopted flood ordinances. Section 401.3. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, deleting the requirement for measuring grade slope and the exception regarding physical barriers and impervious surfaces. Section 401.4, .4, 
The new definitions for expansive and compressible soil in Chapter 2 are, refer are referenced in this section regarding soil tests. Section 403.1.1 on page 91. This section now includes a reference to the figures already in the 2015 edition of the code for precast foundations. They just didn't have a reference in the previous version. Section 403.1.4.1 on page 99. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment to the exceptions to include all freestanding structures and all decks in these categories. Section R 403.1.6. This section was just reworded for clarity. The intent and the effect remain the same. Table 403.3, parentheses 1, on page 102. Footnote C was updated with the current ASCII 32 values for insulation materials. Table R403.4 on page 110. This table now includes the minimum widths for crushed, crushed stone footings based on the width of the foundation wall. Two new footnotes specify how the crushed stone must be cons consolidated and refer to the soil classification table. Section 404.1.3.2. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, adding the references to the figures and tables for foundation reinforcement historically added locally. This includes tables 404.1.2 parentheses 10 and 404.1.2 parentheses 11 and their associated footnotes and figures 404.1.2 parentheses 1 and 404.1.2 parentheses 2. Section R405.1 on page 130. The, the required location for foundation drainage has been clarified to be at or below the top of the footing or below the bottom of the slab. Section R405.2.3 on page 131. Staff recommends discontinuing the existing local amendment reducing the size of sump pits in wood foundations as it has not been used by anyone ever. And <laughs> it's just it, it has no effect, so we just want to do away with it. Uh, section 408.3 on page 133, the option has been added to provide a dehumidifier for moisture control in unvented crawl spaces instead of requiring mechanical ventilation. That's it for Chapter 4. Any questions? No? I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hildebrand for Chapters 5 and 6. Morning, Hap Hildebrandt, City of Fargo Inspections. Chapter 5 is floors, and under section R505.3.2 on page 156, this has to do with cold form steel joists. The spans have been reduced in some areas. Very short and simple. Under R507, page 161, exterior decks. This is where they have increase this the foot the code has increased by several pages and this has been content reorganized so it flows now in the order of the construction so they're starting with the footings and taking it to the end r 507.3 on page 161 the footings staff is recommending that we continue an existing local amendment that deletes this section on footings that keeps us in compliance and with Section R 403.1.4.1 on frost protection that we have adjusted what's required to be, have frost protection. Table 507.3.1 on page 164. That's, we would set up a new local amendment to delete those tables. That is in, coincides with the footing requirements, the deck footings. On table five, R507.4 on page 163, that has deck post heights. The post height allowable for a 4x4 four four has been reduced down to 6 foot 9 inches when you're using a triple ply beam. When you use a 2x2 
true ply beam, it goes back and remains at the eight foot, which everybody's used to working with. R507.5 on page 165, deck beams. The method for calculating the permitted cantilever has changed from one fourth of the actual span to one fourth of the allowable span. Staff is recommending we do a new amendment here to change it back to the actual span, taking the 25% from that actual span. Table R507.5 on page 166. This is deck beam span lengths. The span now includes some single ply header that, and beam that we did not have before. Table R507.6 on 169, deck joist spans for common lumber. The portion of the table that identified the maximum joist span when you were using a cantilever has now been changed to be identified as a maximum cantilever. So what that's done is it's taken away the spans in the 15 book, the spans were reduced when you used the cantilever. Now they're not reduced, but they have included now a, what they call their maximum allowable cantilever, which will be either that or the 25%, whichever is shorter, small. That concludes chapter five. Any questions or comments on five? On deck? I, was, I was asked by Christine to look at the how the, the decks are currently constructed with the with a two ply beam that sandwiches the post. Yes. Do we want to discuss that at this point? It's Yeah, we'd like recommendations. Um, okay. the two ply sandwich beam has been done in Fargo forever and we've allowed it. Other jurisdictions also allow it. Um, it's changed a little bit with the, some fasteners, with new fasteners, new tech screws. Um, so we'd like uh, that to be looked at. The other jurisdictions would also like to keep doing that because there hasn't been failures. But uh, if you'd look at that, that'd be great. Um, also, that also in that regard, the cantilever issue, we had several issues with that in the last few years where it seemed to be that the deck was over-designed but still didn't comply. Is that the case on, uh, on some of the decks? There were some cases of that, yes. Where he had two beams in and didn't comply because it talked about the actual span as, as, instead of what, so if somebody had one beam, they would comply. If they had two, they didn't. It's because they wanted to look at the actual. So if it was 25% of two, it didn't work. If you took one beam out, the whole deck would still comply, but it didn't comply for cantilever. So there's multiple forces working in that. So. And those, those were what Bruce was referring to as the cantilever on the joist. The yeah. can be versus the, the beam one, which is what yeah, so not just look at the sandwich beam issue and and the cantilever. That's he just mentioned that one, um, page 165, 507.5. Um, yeah, what so I'm guessing is that the, the back in that fence. case, well, he created you created the amendment for that also, correct? On the cantilever, mm. yep. Actual span. Yeah, that's what we want to do with okay. the actual. We want to work with the actual span. So yeah, if you, on the beams. I think that's fine as long as you you probably want to specify that the joists have to be one piece joists. They can't splice it over that yeah. second beam line because mm -hmm. what they're getting at is you want your back span to be a, a certain length, and by adding another beam line, mm -hmm. you're, you're shortening your back span. But it's fine as long as that joist is one piece and goes one from piece. the cantilever all the way to the house. That'd be my so suggestion. Maybe, maybe after maybe after this we can discuss that beam splice or the joy splice. Okay. Question on that. We can do that. Okay. And then as far as the uh, the sandwich beam, when did that get taken out? Was that that for 2018 or was that taken out in 2015? It's the, it's don't not sure if it's ever even been in the code. Never been in the code, but it's always been allowed since it's I've been, been here. It's since just everybody's something. been here. In, the, in this city and other jurisdictions. Okay. 
I, I looked into it already a little bit. I, if we wanted to allow that to be used, I think this table where it calls the max post spacing may have to be adjusted to allow to use that detail then, since we don't have any beams that are actually bearing on top of a post. They're all the force right. is going through the, the through forces. bolts. What's the effect with also with the fact that the two beams are not, or the two plies are not attached? That would also have a bearing or not? So as long as they're connected to the joist, that's fine. They're still essentially braced. So having them apart doesn't affect the strength of them. But it's more of that connection from that sandwich beam to the post the itself, because all that force has to go through those bolts and it's not in direct bearing. So I think we can, I can look into it further, but we, we would have to amend this table, this table R507.5 can't be used as is. It would have to, a lot of the post spacings would have to decrease in order to allow to use that sandwich detail. Um, so in effect, every span in that table might change? Correct. Okay. Could that be handled by the requirement of bolting on the two posts? Can it also take care of it as far as the size of the bolts and how many are spacing? Yes, we could look into that to see if we could go to a larger bolt instead. That might be something that's easier than changing the span thing if we just have a requirement for what size bolts have to be used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could look into that and get back to the board on that. So it, it's changed, you know, even with the fasteners, we always re had minimum requirement, half inch bolts and, and washers. And then uh, we saw the contractors using equivalents with the tech screws. And I think if, if we've we, gone back to bolts. We have, we have gone back to bolts with the, with the multitude of options that are out there you know in comp that would possibly be in compliance as a replacement for a half inch galvanized bolts i'd have a manual about like my code book and be looking up every one of these things provided it was identified that this specific screw so we have moved away from that the contractors have moved away from it and we're down to the half inch galvanized bolt we're having success in the field with the builders with that Okay, well, I'll look into it and then we can, maybe me and you can get together and talk about it some more and then bring it back to the, the board at some point. Yeah, any, anything we can do to not amend that table because everybody else uses that table. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in Moorhead, <clears throat> they don't use the sandwich method, but in West Fargo, Horace, other North Dakotas, they still, in the whole state, they do use the bolt rule. Have you received any input on why that method is used? Why just this area wants to use that, but other areas don't use that? I think the reason some of the contractors did it is when it's bolted to a post, it can't rotate or roll on you. And so for them, it was a, a way of, of making sure that beam did twist or roll. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some merit to that. I think that's why it's Although, as you said, some of the fasteners that are there now to connect close to beams are a lot better than we were. It is. So, the sandwich method is one of the simplest ways to go about it. Yeah. Put your post in, hold the beam up, find a level spot, run a screw in, and then drill. Mm -hmm. and it's crazy. Yeah, because I think these details on page 167 show what you're referring to, Clay, on the, the rollover. They, I think it addresses those. It probably didn't more years ago but yeah. now they do address that but yeah I've I've been in some facets of building all my life and I've seen the post and the sandwich meth has been there as long as I've ever seen it act Hap, Mel do you remember when these details did get inserted in the code because when I started there were no details those details all came in the fifth in last, last yeah code. so these details are also new to the code. Dex, dex were addressed in the previous codes with one paragraph referring you to the charts on normal floor construction, normal wall construction, and everything else. In the, old, in the 15 book, it's six pages. 
In the 18 book, it's 12. The next one might be 30. We don't know. Well, it's getting more complex all the time. Each time. <laughs> so. Anything further on Chapter 5? Chapter 6, are we ready? Chapter 6, wall construction. Table R, 602.7, parentheses 1. On page 186, this is girder and header spans on exterior walls. The column, they have relabeled the columns on the chart that used to be 20 and 28. And there's also a 36 foot on there. That's your charts that you use. You can... Uh, flip flop in between them, they reduced that to 12 and 25. So they've kind of spread the chart out, actually made it a little easier to work with for somebody who's trying to figure out what to do with something that's only 20 feet wide and we were stuck on 28 is our minimum. <laughs> and then some of the header spans and stuff have been reduced. And then footnote F has been added and footnote F states that when your beam is not laterally supported, when your beam is not up at the top of the wall and attached to your plates or your equipment like that, your span then is reduced by 30%. The allowable span is reduced by 30%. So that's gonna have some effects out there. There's, I think there's some solutions to that that can be done, but that's a, new change yeah I'm sure that's that is something that will come up I don't know if it's going to be the requirement of a, a plate on top and bottom of that header to stiffen it or what quite, yeah and the, the in the significant changes the example was just studs coming down on the header without a plate and I'm, I'm thinking plates would probably top and bottom would probably going to solve our issue We'll, we'll review that and take a look at it. That's something that's very common out there with yes. higher wall heights. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to table 602.7, parentheses 2 on page 188. This is the gooder and header spans on your interior walls, interior bearing walls. Again, they've relabeled the columns to spread the table a little bit. Some of the spans, again, have been adjusted, and they have added footnote E, which has the same ramifications as the previous one, potentially reducing your allowable spans by 30%. Section R602.7.2 on page 178. This is rim board headers. Staff recommends continuing an existing amendment that reduces the number of full height studs required at the end of each header. Section R602.7.5 on page 90, support for headers. Staff recommends continuing an existing amendment that deletes the sentence that requires the number of full height studs at the header of the header to be in accordance with table R602.7.5. And the next one is table R602.7.5 on page 190. Minimum number of full height studs required at each end of headers is the title. Staff recommends that it, we continue the existing amendment that also deletes that table. That just coincides with that section above it. So, question on that. So how does the contractor know how many full height studs to put in each of the header, depending on uh, opening size? Right now, current practice is, the code is telling us how many jack studs or cripples are required depending on the length, but one king stud only is what's been required and used for ever, play. <laughs> it's one of those, isn't there? What they have, they did last year in this, and I think there might be one more uh, amendment coming up on this. They 
took a look at it and said, you've got a nine foot patio door over here in this wall. If that nine foot patio door is not there, there's going to be seven studs in that wall in that location. We want you to pick up those seven studs you eliminated and put three of them on, extra ones on this end of the beam and the four and four, other four go on the other end of the other beam. So you end up with four, you can end up with two cripples and maybe four or five king studs just on one end of a, of a beam, say for a nine or a 10 foot opening. That's why we had amended that information out of the code at the last cycle. Didn't this table conflict with the other table? Somewhat, yeah. It was I can't specifically, but we were trying to avoid looking at it from the the energy side of it. It was an awful lot of additional wood. You're feeling, you know, you're getting yourself a good, you know, as much as possibly a foot of solid wood on each end. And I don't think anybody ever did any investigation as to why this was introduced to the code in the first place. It's another deal that's been, construction's gone this way since since they started building homes and the need for additional studs. It's lateral supports, I believe, is probably what they were looking for, but they don't want to reduce the number of studs in a, in a wall. So when you remove them for a window or something like that, they want you to make up for them someplace else. Yeah, and I agree that that definitely seems excessive. I'm just wondering, given houses seem to have taller walls, larger openings, what's regulating if uh, there's a 14 foot wide opening and a 10 foot tall bearing wall, if, can they just use one stud as the king stud and that's allowed? The, the homes that I have seen like that, and, and I have seen them, have been engineered and they have got probably a six by six uh, glue lamb type of a stud or, you know, on, on each end of a large opening like that, probably the full 14 or 15 feet high. Okay. Okay. So it is being addressed. In it's, it's, it's addressed when you get to the extremes. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. There's other requirements for studs also, just heights of studs when they get yeah, when maximum get, height, 10 maximum feet height still, anything, that. anything over that needs to be looked at. Yeah. For individual applications. Yep. I, I, I remember comments about there could be six or seven studs on each end of an opening, 10 feet, if you need two or three jacks, plus the full height studs, you could have many on each end. It, it just seemed overkill. Mm -hmm. Further questions on that? <coughs> R602.10, page 190, wall bracing. The staff recommends discontinuing an existing amendment that we have had that allows using section R602.10 from the 2006 IRC. Table 602.10.4 on page 202 and 203, bracing methods. They have removed eight penny common nails from their approved fasteners listing when you're using structural fiberboard sheathing for your braced wall panels. R602.10.4.4 on page 204. Panel joints, this is a new section that requires joints of panel sheathing embraced walls to be blocked and fastened. I can see now that I've got a typo in here. I'm supposed to say when a parallel, parallel joints, horizontal, yeah, the horizontal joints in here. So when you're, put, when you're laying your sheathing down and going sideways with it, the section of it that's going to be identified on the corner of the house or midpoint near wall, wherever your braced wall panel is, they will now have to be blocked at those 
horizontal seams and nailed. And that's a new specific section that they put in there. Table R602.10.5 on page 205. This is the minimum length of braced wall panels. They moved, the re they moved the portal framing portion of this down to the bottom of the table, but they added on footnotes C, D, and E. They changed from identifying this from going from the maximum opening height to the maximum header height. And that's probably more just on a clarification type of thing. R603. Page 221, this is cold framed steel wall framing. They made some minor changes in that area. We don't see very much of any steel <coughs> framing in residential. So minor changes, no effect on us. R609, page 347 on exterior windows and doors. And on 609.6.2, they created a new section identified as impact, pro impact systems testing and labeling. And it's a couple paragraphs on new <coughs> testing methods and requirements that would apply mainly to the glass, you know, the window door, the manufacturer's type of stuff. It's not something that we're going to be dealing with, you know, on a job site or a contract would be the manufacturer's deal. I close chapter six. Any uh, any questions on anything? Thank you. Thank you. Motion to approve those. So yeah, I think do we, we have can, to do uh, see if there's any further staff reports. Uh, none at this time. Like I said, keep notes. Um, you can make comments anytime, even to staff, if you want to look at anything further. Um, and we will be reviewing everything. We'll probably start December, looking at all the comments that were made, and bring it up at the, this time at the end of the meeting. Call for a motion to adjourn. Make the motion. A second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>